Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm head of corporate for a PR agency. So, um, not quite as creative as um, the lovely Ricardo, am I right, who went before me. Um, but hopefully it will be interesting for you. So, when I first started in this business, um, we used to fax press releases to journalists. And journalists also only dealt with one beat. So, if you had an automotive journalist, that's all he did. And so, as a result, they spent a lot of time on very long lunches at the expense of, of clients. Very nice. We also used to demonstrate our impact through coverage books. Big coverage books meant you were very successful. Small coverage books meant you were very intellectual. Um, and that was it. That was our entire form of communication. But things have changed, obviously. I believe we're at a tipping point. It kind of started with the Arab Spring, where you saw social media actually become something beyond just a channel for communication. It actually galvanized people. It became an engagement tool. It ensured that communities on the ground were able to talk to each other in a medium that nobody had previously understood. And it gave impact and credence to an unsung voice of people. Now, it's changed even further. A lot of people have been talking about this, and from a news media perspective, it was very interesting, particularly from the UK, because we saw social media actually become the primary form of content. So you have the likes of Periscope, where it meant people were live streaming the terror as it happened. This is really different. I mean, you know, as a communicator, how do we actually communicate when we're no longer in control of the conversation? So we have what is called, oh, we, we always create labels. I work in PR, I spend my entire time creating labels. So we've created this label called an accidental journalist. So you'll see this, and you've probably seen this quite um, frequently. When an airplane, crashes or is, you know, something happens at the airport, it's no longer the airplane spokesperson who tells you what is happening. It's actually the person on their phone tweeting the situation. They're, or they're on Periscope and they're telling everyone what is happening. So who do the journalists go to? Do they go to the spokespeople? No, they don't they go straight to the accidental journalist, and they become the voice of communications. So you see this happening. How do you validate that? If you're a brand or your company, how do you validate it when you have somebody speaking on your behalf that is not prepared, does not have messages, does not have any speaking notes? They're just saying what they think from an emotional perspective. And these people are going to be talking on your behalf. And then it becomes even more complicated, because we have the likes of Facebook. Now, I'm old, so I use Facebook. Um, and in fact, um, a lot of older people are now using Facebook. And what you'll see is actually in the UK alone, 84% of adults actually use Facebook. It's just terrifying. What's interesting with Facebook is that they, people didn't understand that they were actually editorially controlling content that was being pushed out in the channel. So there was a huge, like in the UK, it was a huge surprise when they discovered that there were editorial teams curating content that be pushed along the channel. I mean, everyone was surprised. What was even more surprising is actually when they took away those editorial teams. So in August this year, they replaced editorial teams with algorithms. Not a great success, because actually what happened is the algorithm, algorithm oh, I can't bloody say it now, were taken over by smart and savvy developers who thought it would be fun to actually push content that was absolutely false. 
So you had two instances where um, there was a false story about a Fox News presenter, and there was the age-old urban myth about McDonald's and a chicken sandwich. I'm not going to say anything more. I think you know that one. So it's very interesting. It's like, how do you validate news now we're moving into more of an automated age where you don't even have editorial control by humans? And what does that mean for communicators? What does it mean for Facebook now that Facebook is actually taking more of a primary role in actually determining what kind of information goes on its channel? Now, most of you will recognize this picture. For me, this picture encapsulates um, the horrors of war. For Facebook, it is an image of a young person completely naked, and therefore it should not be distributed on its Facebook channel. Where have we, how have we got to a situation where we're allowing a channel to dictate and censor in what is supposed to be a democratic society. And yet, it took down this picture, not once, repeatedly, because it felt it was inappropriate. What does that mean for us communicators? When we're using content, or we're pushing content, that is content that has actually been shared before, So where are people actually going for the news? Now, HuffPo, for me, was um, a pioneer in this area. HuffPo understood that traditional news channels wasn't, weren't really reflecting what people actually wanted. And so HuffPo was one of the first to actually start using um, individuals to actually articulate their voice. And um, any good communicators will use HuffPo for opinion pieces and actually give a very distinctive point of view. It's developed even further. So BuzzFeed, for many of my clients, they, they see BuzzFeed as a great place. It's like, 10 reasons why you have to live in London. Click this if you think that you heart Justin Bieber and everything he's doing. It's no longer like that. Um, a month ago, we had the editors of BuzzFeed into the agency. And one of the things that they're saying is actually, because of the luxury of having advertisers, wanting to be on BuzzFeed, they've actually got more money to put into real journalism. So they've actually got a team that does investigative reporting in a way that, if I go back to those journalists I talked about at the start, the ones who used to have lovely long lunches and just cover one beat, now they cover several beats and they have very short lunches because they have no time because subscriptions are down, because circulation numbers are down, and because they're dictated to by advertising revenues. Whereas the likes of BuzzFeed and the likes of Vice are actually where people want to put their money. And so that is where you're finding real investigative journalism, and you're finding journalism that appeals to particularly young people who are fed up of a diet of blandness. And and actually want to see an opinion. Reddit is another interesting space. So Reddit is another community which started off as a blog, but it's quickly growing momentum, where people actually have an opinion. And what does this tell us for communicators? It is no longer good enough to broadcast what you think. If you just push information out there, People will get pissed off. What you see, the ones that are actually succeeding in this world, the ones that actually are delivering good content, interesting content, are the ones that engage with their audience. And that is why these guys are successful. So you could just put your head in the sand. You could decide that this is going to happen anyway with the kind of work company that is quite stuck in the mud, it's not going to change, and absolutely, why should we care? Let's just continue broadcasting. Why shouldn't you do that? Well, there are a number of different reasons. Firstly, and I'm going to say this because I'm head of a corporation, it impacts, like, good reputation impacts on your share price. It impacts on how you actually are able to do business. 
So I've got the stats here because I'm terrible at remembering statistics. But according to Standard & Poor's, a 5% improvement in reputation produces a 1.5% uplift in share price. This is why it's important that you control your reputation. Why else? Because purchasing decisions are actually made on how people perceive your brand, the reputation of your brand. Now, one of our competitors has done some very good research, and much as I hate to admit it, um, the Edelman Brand Index demonstrates that 75% of purchasing decisions are now based on peer-to-peer -peer conversations. So your company's reputation is being dealt with outside of your typical audience space. Why else is it important? Because talent is not going to go to a company where they don't believe in reputation. People are 10 times more likely to work for a company with a strong reputation rather than a weak reputation. And ultimately, the only difference in any organization that we work for or we represent is the people who work in it. If you can't attract ta talent, then it means that you will not succeed. And then finally, and this, this is the bit that scares me the most, policy decisions are increasingly being made based on the general public. If your company that is failing to see or take account of what the public feels, or failing to actually change and evolve, then more regulation is likely to be imposed upon you, which ultimately can impact on your license to operate. I think it's all about having a plan. He who fails to plan is planning to fail, or something along those lines, yes. And I, the reason I think this is because it can actually be a pretty scary world. And if you start to like, look at it in a kind of, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to do this, you start to get palpitations and you just don't know where to begin. The better way is to be systematic in your approach to communications. Now, it's very strange for me to say this because I'm the most unsystematic person in the world. But I've actually learned this in the last however many years I've been doing this, that if you have a plan, that you can actually do this. There's this funny thing called Brexit. I say funny, that's my British sense of humor. It's not funny at all. And for a while, there's this thing called the London bubble. I was talking about this with my um, affiliate colleagues um, last night. Us Londoners like to feel that we are dictating the mood of the UK. And prior to the, um, the Brexit vote, we were having very, very um, gratifying conversations about where it would go. So if you looked in this Twitter space, if you looked in dinner party conversations, we were 100% convinced there was no way we would end up voting to leave Europe. Absolutely convinced. Clearly, we exist in a London bubble. And the reality is, any communicator should be aware that conversations do not just happen at a certain level. Not only do they not happen, that pretty influential decisions can be made by not understanding your audience c correctly. Now, what's this got to do with Marmite? Well, as you'll know, Unilever had a number of conversations with supermarkets about the consequences of Brexit. And some of those conversations were effectively, we're going to have to put our prices up across a range of products in order to kind of cushion some of the costs that are being put on us. But probably too early to tell. But I would say probably not going to be. God, I'm really sticking my neck out. Is this being recorded? Um, and the reason, in my mind, is because Unilever has an extremely strong reputation. They don't just exist on their products. They're very, very savvy. And I can say this because I do not work with Unilever. So I can say this without any kind of accusation of bias. They're very smart. And they have a very clever plan. So one of the clever plans is understanding that your business is beyond the products that you produce. 
So having a point of view that takes you up a level. So in the Unilever case, you can see the Better Futures um, initiative, which is all about sustainability, it's all about purpose, it's all about giving an emotional reason to believe in the company as a whole. And they've done this really smartly. So it's everything from a you know, beautiful website with beautiful videos on it, in which people can see why you should care about the future, to you know, when they do any kind of announcement, I imagine everyone internally has to tie it back to the better future. And that's just smart. That's understanding that people want to see beyond the products, beyond profitability, beyond just kind of, we're a company that makes stuff. They want to see why you matter. So I believe there are six reputation building blocks. And these reputation building blocks, both for agencies and you know, for clients, will allow you to adapt to this changing world. So the first is an audience. Now, I'm a mum. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to say anything about being a parent. Um, but if you look at traditional ways of looking at audience, often people would say, you're a mum, therefore, you go on to net mums or mums net, therefore, you talk about these products. Bullshit. I'm a mum, I talk on WhatsApp, I talk on Facebook, sometimes you use Snapchat to be a bit cool. You know, I have a friend who's a policy maker, I have another friend who is a, a journalist, and we all have these conversations that completely overlap each other. So why do marketeers, why do communicators silo us into little boxes? For me, that's laziness. So the key thing for me is you need to actually understand your audience. And that means focus groups, find out what they're really talking about. It means actually looking in the social space and discovering what they're talking about, creating profiles that are a little bit more sophisticated, and just being a bit more intelligent with how you actually address this. Second thing is opportunity. It's very easy to get an idea about what you want to talk about and decide to own it, and then take it a certain level and then you'll find that one of your general managers will turn around and say, that doesn't actually work for our business. Issues, you need to understand the business landscape in which you operate and what is authentic for your company. Because there's no point you suddenly having an opinion on women's rights if you have an affiliate over in Indonesia that is completely 100% male and has given no women's rights ever, as an example. You've got to understand your business, you've got to understand the environment in which you work, and you've got to actually understand what people expect you to be talking about. So this is based on insights, and again, I cannot underplay this. We have a team back in um, the agency, hopefully working this, um, this morning. We have a team who actually spend their time doing focus groups, actually going out and talking to third-party experts. I mean, there was, I, went, I heard one of the, the lecturers talk about behavioral scientists. For me, this is the way forward. This is the future. You have to actually understand how people are thinking. You have to have real insights. And they can't just be a coverage, you know, quickly search coverage on Factiva or Gorkana. That's enough. It's no longer enough. You have to be a bit more sophisticated in this. Engagement. So back to my broadcast challenge. People don't want to be shouted at. We want a conversation. We want to talk about things. But how do we actually create something that people want to talk about? Well, if you've got your insights and you've got your analysis, then you can actually decide where the gap is. What is the thing that authentically you as a company can own and legitimately talk about that people will actually want to hear? 
how can actually you create a point of view that is not just you saying this because you make yogurt, for example. You're saying this because you've seen a genuine issue that people want to have a conversation about. Now, I'm sure I'm not saying anything, but have a platform. Stand for something. Don't just be a company that is vacuous. I'm sorry, but like today's audience wants something more. They want to actually believe in what you believe, but they can, they'll only do that if it's authentic with the values that you represent. Then amplification. Now, it's really nice to be here because there are so many different disciplines in this room. PR is kind of a bit late to this, but we've suddenly woken up to the fact that it was getting to the point where other disciplines were doing our job better than us. So I'd see like paid content that was brilliant PR, but effectively it's because the media houses appreciated that we were failing to understand the environment in which we're working. Now, PRs are now starting to take that back because it's all very well creating content that exists in a paid space. But if it's not based on insight, insights, it's, if it's not based on an understanding of the business, if it's not based on genuine understanding of an audience, then it, do, it completely falls flat. So amplification is understanding how you can use all of those different content channels, is making sure you have a content strategy, is making sure that actually you work with others so that you have one voice that is consistent across all of these channels. And finally, measurement. So sadly, as I said, the days of the, the coverage book are over. Um, it means that you have to look at focus groups or tracking influences in the social space or even, you know, looking at net promoter scores. There are so many different ways that we can actually measure our campaigns. It's too lazy and too unsophisticated to just look at media coverage because it's not actually genuinely reflective. And the danger is, if you do that, you'll end up with a Marmite situation. So that's it. I think I've rattled through this. So um, thank you. That was me. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you if there's any questions, but I don't know if I want to answer any. Any questions? <sighs> Hopefully that means that the presentation was so self-explanatory, you have no... If you do have any questions or you want to tweet, um, please send them to me. Thank you, everyone.